missing his mail. What? His mail. Well, what email do you have in Portugal? All right, welcome back, everyone. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> welcome back, everyone. <laughs> All right, so let's start uh, this afternoon's session with Omar. Please, thank you very much. With Omar Montasser from UC Berkeley, who is going to tell us about learning guarantees for distribution shifts. Welcome. Okay. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to first thank the organizers for putting together such a nice, wonderful workshop. And I would like to thank them for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Uh, today I'll talk to you about some current ongoing work with uh, Emmanuel Abe from EPFL and Han Chao from TTIC. So, um, in the past decade, we have been witnessing a lot of amazing progress in machine learning, uh, starting from image classification to doing uh, or playing like complex games to uh, doing protein structure prediction, generating images, and more recently with large language models. And not only that, we also see this ever-growing reliance on machine learning in all sorts of modern-day um, uh, applications, so from like self-driving cars to medical imaging, face recognition, um, speech recognition, and the list goes on and on. Now, uh, despite this ever-growing reliance and despite this sort of amazing progress in, in machine learning, current ML systems can be brittle in, in very surprising ways. So here are a few, perhaps, examples uh, of instantiations that illustrate um, this sort of brittleness. One uh, popular uh, phenomena is the phenomena of adversarial examples, where you can, uh, we can perturb inputs, so we can add adversarial noise, to the inputs in a way that is imperceptible, at least to us humans, but this sort of breaks uh, machine learning models uh, in, in terms of like making them make mistakes in their predictions. Another example um, I will basically refer to as like maybe subtle distribution shifts, where researchers have tried to recreate uh, new test sets for standard, standard benchmarks, such as CIFAR-10 and uh, ImageNet, and surprisingly, when uh, neural nets are evaluated, um, on these like new test sets, we see like sort of degradation in performance that is kind of significant in terms of like their accuracy. And uh, maybe another, maybe something that we also, um, okay, sometimes people refer to it as this uh, like changing environments or maybe like uh, spurious correlations or sort of this uh, maybe desired property that, that we would like to develop or learn uh, predictors that do well uh, regardless of the environment. So we would really like to classify cows correctly, whether they are um, on a green pasture or whether they are on the beach. This is actually a real photo of cows uh, in Corsica, I believe. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, and also, for example, for self-driving cars, we'd really like to have like self-driving cars that uh, drive in different cities. So, um, like when uh, the, the, the today's talk will be really thinking about um, how can we learn predictors robust to distribution shifts. But when thinking about this question of like tackling uh, distribution shifts, like the first thing maybe that pops up, like the main tech, uh, maybe challenge is really how do we mathematically describe distribution shifts? So if we want to sort of derive machine learning guarantees for distribution shifts, we want to somehow be able to describe the distributions that we care about and the things that we maybe uh, would like to uh, derive guarantees for. So I'd like to maybe give you just a brief survey of um, like some of the prior work uh, that can be viewed, like when we view it from this lens, the lens of distribution shifts. So there's um, a large literature on the problem of covariate shift, domain adaptation, and transfer learning. And typically in, the, in this area, people start with like having a source distribution. This is where you see training, uh, where you're training examples from. And then you have some target distribution. And typically, a, tar a different target distribution Q. And typically, people um, relate these two distributions in terms of divergence measures. For example, KL divergence or um, the total variation distance or thinking about um, important uh, weights or likelihood ratios. 
And then they give guarantees in terms of like, if I see data from P, uh, how much does my performance degrade on Q given that the distance, the KL distance between them is, is this much. So this is one form of like uh, theoretical guarantees that people have worked on. Another maybe um, uh, related uh, uh, line of work is the, uh, what, what is referred to as distributionally robust optimization. And in this work, People study like if I have a source distribution P and then I am interested in uh, doing well on a family of distributions that is related to this source distribution uh, also based on some divergence measure, for example, like this family of F divergences, how can we sort of learn a predictor that does well on this family? So the main difference here is that we're not interested in only a single target distribution, but more like a family. And the sort of the common characteristic between these two lines of works is that they look at uh, divergence measures. So this is sort of the main thing that we use to relate the distributions. Uh, another maybe related uh, line of work is this, the line on um, invariant risk minimization, where in some sense there is no uh, explicit structure that uh, relates the training distribution with the maybe potential test distributions. We just assume that uh, there are different environments and then we see data from the training, uh, from some training environments, and we would like to do well on test environments. But because of the, there's sort of no explicit mathematical structure, sometimes the guarantees given here are not, not very uh, strong. Now, uh, a related, uh, another related line of work is that on data augmentation. So this is a common technique used in machine learning today, where in addition to the training, original training examples, we will augment them with transformations of these training examples. But typically, the main sort of um, reason or the, the, the thing that we want, that we get away, uh, that we gain from doing these augmentations is really a sort of performance on the original distribution. So we do these transformations, but then we just measure performance on the source distribution. So we are not sort of uh, doing these transformations to, to help us with distribution shifts. Okay, so given all of this, so sort of, uh, so far as sort of the story is that, okay, we, we relate distributions in terms of divergence measures. And uh, today's talk, I would like to maybe uh, motivate a different formulation of looking at distribu distribution shifts through the language of transformations. So we'll consider like having a collection of transformations uh, T where every transformation maps from the input space X to X. So we'll only consider transformations on the covariates, for example, like images. So what are some common examples of transformations? So we could have, for example, in the space of images, we could have rotations of images, we could have translations, uh, or we can even have, for example, um, uh, if you are familiar with adversarial patches, so for example, researchers have shown that you can break machine learning models by sticking like these adversarial patches on these real world objects and this sort of breaks the models. So this um, adversarial patches, for example, can also be modeled uh, using this language of transformations. Now, uh, beyond this, also, like, researchers have created the data sets where they apply different sorts of transformations, um, like adding noise to images and all sorts of, like, uh, things that you can do. So this is maybe just to illustrate some examples where what are, like, some common transformations that we can consider or think about when we have uh, transformations. But also, I'm, and I'm, I'm not... Uh, my background is very little uh, on the topic of like optimal transport, but I realized or I learned that in general, like if you have two different distributions, P and Q in RD, it is possible to, um, um, there always exists, or under very mild conditions, there exists a map where uh, a map or a transformation T that maps distribution P and Q. So this is just to say that in general, this language of transformations or using transformations as maps uh, that map from one distribution to the other is very general. And so this is what we will consider. So basically in today's talk, we should think of, we have some source distribution D, this is where we observe training data from, and then we have a family of distributions that are described as transformations of the source distribution. Um, so we apply the, the every T in the, in, the, in the family to the distribution to get like a target distribution. So with that in mind, I would like to further specify now the problem setup. So we have some collection of transformations as I described before, and there are maybe two ways of thinking about this. So either the downstream application that we are considering already tells us what transformations we should be considering, 
Or another view is that um, maybe this is a choice that is made by the learning algorithm. So the learning algorithm will choose some rich family of transformations in the hopes that that will sort of model distribution shifts, uh, distribution shifts that we might encounter uh, when the model is deployed. In addition to this, we will have some class of predictors. Uh, we will denote this by H. So think of this as your, uh, uh, the, the model class you're using to, uh, to, learn, uh, to learn, like for example, neural, neural networks. And we observe some data, like a labeled uh, training example, from some <laughs> unknown source distribution. So what will be the, the goal uh, with, these, uh, with these objects or with these inputs? So our goal is to learn a predictor H hat that uh, performs well uniformly on all the transformations. And to write this uh, mathematically, so we, will, uh, we would like to learn a predictor H hat that satisfies the following objective. So let's uh, walk through or unpack this. So the first thing on the left hand side, this is the performance of H hat. Uh, this is the predictor that we learn. And this uh, max over all transformations, this just measures the worst case error of the predictor H hat. So notice here that we are evaluating H hat on transformations of the original inputs X. So this sort of, mem uh, this resembles the, the target distributions as encoded by, by the family uh, T. And we want the performance of the predictor H hat to match the best uh, uh, predictor H star in the class capital H. So the class capital H is going to be the benchmark that we compete against. And you can think of this benchmark as this is the best we can achieve using uh, the model class uh, H, even when we know the true population distribution. So when we have access to the true population distribution and we have access to the family of transformations, we can just minimize this objective. This is the best we can do. And we want to be epsilon close to it just from a finite sample. So this is going to be sort of the challenge. And now the question is, and I should say that this objective has appeared before uh, in the literature in the context of distributionally robust optimization and in multi-distribution learning. The main difference here is that we are considering this objective uh, from the perspective or using this uh, language of transformations. OK, so if this objective is clear, yeah. And it's also clear on this, I guess this is important, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a quick question, because I guess this is going to be important. So you mentioned the existence of adversarial examples, right, in your yes. previous slides. So the worst case error of a learned predictor, if, if there exist adversarial examples, I guess this worst case error can be almost arbitrarily bad, no? So OK, th that's a perfect, qu excellent question. So um, the, uh, in, in, this, in this setup, the, the predictor H hat is only, uh, or the performance of H hat is only measured with respect to the family of transformations T. So this is sort of the constraint that is imposed. So for example, if we consider the set of all transformations, then yes, we will probably most likely find a transformation that messes up the predictor H hat very badly. And uh, so the, the idea here, or the thing maybe to think about is that, for example, in the space of images, if we rotate the image, at least for animals maybe, or some classification tasks, that these transformations do not change the ground truth labeling. I think this is sort of the thing you should, one should be maybe uh, thinking about. Because if a transformation changes uh, the ground truth labeling, then uh, there is nothing that basically that we, that we can do. So this is an assumption that we make, that in some sense, the, uh, this formulation aims to only consider or tackle distribution shifts that we know that the ground truth labeling will not change with respect to the distribution shift. And then if the ground truth doesn't change with the distribution shift, we should do well on it uh, or like predict correctly. Yeah, question. Uh, great question, yeah. Yeah, also, yeah, feel free to stop me at any point. Um, okay, so uh, we want to learn a predictor H hat where the worst case error over uh, transformations matches the optimal uh, that can be achieved using the class H, yes? Uh, that's also another excellent question. So it is not a priori clear whether it is possible to, uh, in some sense, 
um, so okay, so another objective that one can consider is that instead of competing with the worst case uh, over transformations, you want to compete separately with the best that can be achieved on each transformation separately. And that, a priori, it is not clear whether that goal is possible to achieve with a single predictor. So yeah, the challenge here is really we want a single predictor that works as, as well as possible for all transformations. But, and we will consider a relaxation of this objective towards the end of the talk. Great question. Okay, so with this setup in mind, maybe let's think of, okay, ways of achieving this. So like what would be a good H hat that satisfies this objective. So maybe a starting point would be to consider empirical risk minimization. So this is a standard procedure, do, uh, a standard principle that we have in ML, where we look over the class capital H for a predictor that minimizes the error on the training examples. So will this do well on transformations? So uh, I think, okay, the answer is no, it's not gonna do well because we don't really tell it. We don't give it any description of the transformations that we, are, uh, that we care about. So in the worst case, there will always be uh, something that it, uh, it, it messes up. So we propose a different procedure, and this is something, okay, maybe it's, uh, like it's sort of in, uh, intuitive. So given the, the training data, let us minimize the worst case error on the empirical data. So let's look for a predictor H that minimizes the worst ca case error with respect to transformations on the, on the training samples. And I should say that, uh, okay, this uh, sort of min-max optimization problems have appeared before in the literature, similar problems, uh, such as in adversarial examples, and also in the context of GANs, um, though the, the objectives in, in these other lines of work is different, but here we see a similar sort of um, meta, maybe, framework is that we have like two objects where, for example, here we have maybe neural networks representing classifiers. We can also represent transformations with neural networks. And it's like you have two, these two uh, competing players, like the H player tries to find the classifier that minimizes the objective. And then the transformation player tries to maximize the value of this objective by finding a transformation that makes it harder for the, for the predictor. Okay. so. Um, Highlighting, I guess, this game theoretic view, what guarantee can we give uh, for this learning rule? So if we have an oracle, someone gives us a black box where we give it an input, uh, a collection of label training examples, and it solves this optimization problem for us. It returns some H hat that minimizes this objective. What can we say uh, about the guarantee of, of, this, uh, of such a method? So we can say that uh, for uh, a generic sort of statement that for any class H and any collection of transformations with high probability over the draw of the training data, we will uh, learn that the returned predictor H hat that minimizes this objective will have worst case error on the population distributions that competes with the, uh, with the benchmark opt. This is the thing I defined in the previous slide and uh, plus some deviation term just that comes from statistical estimation. So, um, okay, I guess there are two things to, uh, to focus on here. First, we are, uh, here we are saying sort of a generalization statement that the predictor H hat will have low error on the target distributions. So not just on the empirical sample uh, uh, that we observe, but only uh, also on the underlying distributions. So we will be at most opt plus this deviation term. And the thing maybe to pay attention to here is that this, uh, this term is controlled by the VC dimension of the composition of H with T. So um, how does this composition, what does this composition look like? So if we use neural networks for both like the predictors and the transformations, it really looks like basically a larger or a deeper neural network where we just stitch together the transformation and then we follow it up with the, with the predictor. So, um, uh, okay, maybe I should say a little bit about the, the proof of this, of this, so very simple proof. So once we have, uh, once we consider the composition of H with T by um, invoking like uh, uniform convergence guarantees for, the, for this bigger class, this H composed with T, uh, which is controlled by VC dimension, we can uh, argue that minimizing this objective will achieve um, uh, the, the sort of the guarantee that we are looking for. Yes? Um, okay, so that's a, another great question. So we don't put any restrictions. This is uh, because we are competing uh, with this benchmark, this opt. So 
it might be that T is very like rich, the collection of transformations is very rich, and uh, your hypothesis class is maybe very simple that it is not able to minimize the worst case error uh, across all transformations. So basically the opt can be very bad. Basically what I'm saying is that if the opt is say one half, like and you can't do better, uh, something better than random guessing, then th your task is sort of easy because the best you can do with your model class is, is like, is, is not great. But, so, uh, okay, so these types of guarantees, we don't really need to know opt. We're, we are promised that we'll be very close to opt without knowing opt, but there are ways to sort of compute approximations of opt. I mean, okay, information theoretically, but not like computationally. Uh, yeah, uh, great questions. Yes? Ah, great. So yeah, the, the, the O tilde notation hides dependence on delta, but it's going to be like log one over delta, uh, like standard like sample complexity guarantees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, great question. So I should I should say that yes, when opt is zero. So if opt is zero, that means there is a predictor H star in the class that achieves a zero error on all transformations. So if you think, for example, the simple example of image rotations, like if a neural network manages to classify like the original distribution correctly, we should expect it to do well also on rotations of the, of the, of the original images. And um, uh, so in the case that opt is equal to zero, we can achieve a fast rate where we drop the dependence. Uh, in, instead of square root, we can achieve like VC over N. We'll also see another instantiation or another example where we can achieve a fast rate towards the end of the talk. Um, okay, so, but I think, okay, the thing maybe to, uh, I guess, also look at is this, the VC dimension of the composition. I mean, this is just an upper bound on the sample complexity. So a, a natural question to ask is, can we improve this? Can we do better than just, um, maybe there's a, fa like, a more efficient uh, learning rule that learns with fewer samples uh, than this. But we show sort of a, a negative a result uh, to, uh, towards this question where we prove a lower bound showing that this dependence on VC dimension of the composition uh, is um, in some sense unavoidable when we restrict ourselves to proper learning algorithms or proper learning rules. And by proper, we mean that any learning rule that is restricted to outputting a predictor that sits inside the model class capital H. So, um, this is sort of a, a similar pheno phenomena in terms of like guarantees that appears also in adversarial learning. But an open question here is whether one can do better with improper learning algorithms. So if we think of uh, algorithms that output a predictor outside the benchmark, uh, outside the hypothesis class that we are competing against, it is possible that maybe we can do better than just uh, better in terms of the dependence on the VC dimension. So something to think about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's another uh, great question. So we will see examples where the VC dimension of the composition is not really much greater than VC dimension of the, in, like, the original class H. But, but yes, you're perfectly, uh, your question is, is perfect. Because if the VC dimension of the composition is infinite, this lower bound is saying that we can't uh, 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 learn the composition, or I mean learn the, with, resp with respect to these transformations, uh, using proper learning rules. But it's still open whether uh, maybe, you know, the, the improper learning algorithm will not depend at all on the complexity of T, and then maybe it is possible even then. Yes? Ah, great question. So yeah, for the lower bound, we just construct uh, one single hypothesis class and um, like a collection of predictors and we construct a collection of transformations and we show that for, for, for this construction, the lower bound, uh, the sample complexity is indeed at least, yeah. And so it's a weaker sort of lower bound than saying for any class and for any, for any transformation. Yes, exactly. Doing some like exponent, well, so basically doing some exponent challenge, which is like 
Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, exactly. So it might be that if you consider specific hypothesis classes and specific transformations, you might get like better refined guarantees. Yeah. Okay, so maybe uh, to continue uh, with that, maybe I'll provide you with some examples of transformations and some of like uh, examples of how do we compute the VC dimension uh, for this. So maybe uh, like something that is very simple is considering linear transformations. So in the case of images, so we can apply, for example, rotations on images or translations, uh, or uh, I guess the, um, like adding noise to images, even like this phenomenon of ad, like at least adversarial patches, they can be uh, formulated as linear transformations. Okay, so uh, this is just to say that the linear transformations are actually popular and widely used in practice, and this sort of uh, generic theorem from the previous slide will give us some guarantees on it. So what we can say about the VC dimension of the composition of H composed with T is that if when, you, when T is a linear collection of transformations, uh, uh, for any class H that is of the form that starts with a linear map followed by some arbitrary map. So, uh, this applies to feed-forward neural networks, and I think many modern like neural network architectures, they almost always start with some linear map and then maybe some nonlinearities. So we can say that the VC dimension of the composition of H with T is going to be at most the VC dimension of the original class. So this is to say, like, if you consider feed-forward neural networks, once you compose them with a linear transformation, you just get back the same sort of class. And uh, the, in term, like from an information theoretic perspective or a sample complexity perspective, the problem is not harder than uh, the standard like fact learning problem. So I kind of find it a bit surprising because in some sense we're getting something for free, I feel, like uh, because VC dimension quantifies uniform convergence over like the, the class and is necessary for fact learning. But somehow here we, we can say something more is that, okay, if we are concerned about linear transformations, we can also achieve like, um, like good performance on linear transformations with roughly the same number of samples. Opt Sorry? Opt, opt is worse. Yes, that's the catch. Well, it depends on the distribution. It may be worse. Um, okay, so another example, maybe we uh, can consider also nonlinear transformations, so something that I uh, kind of alluded to uh, uh, earlier. So we can also consider representing transformations using feed-forward neural networks. So for example, like uh, a network with depth LT and uh, a total of P sub T parameters. And then if we also use neural networks for the hypothesis class, so we'll have some L sub H and PH parameters, then like using this, uh, we can bound also the VC dimension of the composition just by invoking like classical results in the literature. So because the composition of these two uh, will be just a deeper feed for neural network with more parameters, and by invoking these results, we will get that the VC dimension, uh, like for instance, one result uh, by Bartlett, it all uh, tells us that the VC dimension of the composition will be just the sum of the depths and then uh, multiplied by the, the number of parameters. So this is just to say that there are like maybe general examples where we can compute the VC dimension of the composition and uh, it's not like very crazy. Um, okay, so with that I would like to perhaps uh, talk about as like I think another challenge. Uh, so this is maybe the second part of the talk. Uh, so I guess in the previous part we sort of assumed that we have some uh, oracle that solves this optimization problem. So we give it training data and it solves this min-max optimization problem. But in many like practical scenarios or many situations, we can't maybe solve this uh, min-max or maybe we just have access to an off-the-shelf supervised learning method or we can say like an ERM oracle. So just a method that minimizes error on the uh, training data. Now, uh, can we uh, solve this optimization problem using only an ERM, an ERM oracle? Uh, so here's maybe one uh, attempt, like a first attempt one can consider. So we, we will modify the ERM by adding like information about the transformations. So one thing we can do is just minimize the average error across all transformations. And for now we can consider like having a finite uh, set of transformations. So this is maybe a reasonable thing to do and this is like you can view data augmentation um, as, as doing or as minimizing this objective, like you, because in data augmentation you randomly sample a transformation and then you minimize error with respect to that. So, okay, so w will this work? So this will work if uh, the benchmark, the best we can do using the class opt, is gonna be zero. 
meaning that if, there, if the data is separable with respect to all transformations, then this uh, minimizing the average also minimizes the max, and we will, we will be able to sort of solve this problem with, with one oracle call to ERM. But in general, the more challenging setting is when opt is not zero. So when the data is not separable with respect to all transformations. So the, the question still stands. Can we actually minimize this objective using an ERM oracle? And uh, to, to sort of solve this question, uh, a, a useful sort of uh, way of looking at the question is viewing it as a, a zero-sum game between, between two players. So if we cast this problem as a zero-sum game where we have um, the T player, so this is a player over that plays mixed strategies over transformations, and then we have the hypothesis player or the H player that uh, uh, plays ERM, empirical risk minimization. So using this framework of like, uh, I guess, minim um, playing zero-sum games or like um, uh, from online learning literature, like no regret learners, um, we can uh, sort of solve this, the, this problem. So I would like to maybe uh, at, give a high level view of how to do this. So we will use this uh, classical algorithm from online lear learning literature called HEDGE, uh, sorry, HEDGE or multiplicative weights. So how does hedge or multiplicative weights uh, work? So we start with a uniform distribution over the transformations. And then we solve a uh, weighted ERM problem. So as we saw before, we minimize the average with respect to this weights. We, minim we run ERM. And then ERM sends back a predictor H1. So once we receive the response from, from ERM, we will update our weighting on the transformations. So uh, on transformations that we did well, the weight stays the same. And on transformations that we did bad on, we will upweight them because they, now they are more important. We want to do well on the ones that we missed from the previous run. So, um, and mathematically, this will be sort of the update rule. So we take the weight from the previous round on a transformation and then multiply it by e to the minus eta with the accuracy of the predictor on, the, on that transformation. So um, once we perform this update and if we play for uh, capital R rounds, and as I mentioned in each round, we are solving a weighted ERM problem. So basically, now we're not just solving a single ERM problem, we are solving a sequence of uh, uh, weighted ERM problems that uh, where the sort of the weights are adaptive. Uh, it, uh, they are sort of computed adaptively based on the responses that we get from ERM. And this is similar also to boosting and so forth. Um, okay, so what is the guarantee that we get? So we can just invoke, take a black box uh, like guarantee of hedge and uh, put it in the language uh, of this problem. So the regret guarantee of hedge tells us that the, the loss of the best uh, expert. Uh, I mean, there are multiple ways of writing this. One is with a min, one with a max. The, the, the one that serves us is the max. So we will say that the max over all transformations and the average error, um, where at the end we look at the average over all our predictors, is going to have an error that competes with uh, sort of the average loss throughout the runtime of this uh, uh, algorithm, like uh, the, the average loss over our rounds. And then we have some suboptimality guarantee that depends on how, for how long do we run this game. And so if we want to set this to epsilon, then uh, the, the, the oracle complexity or the number of times we call ERM is going to be like log the size of the transformations uh, divided by epsilon squared. Okay, so uh, all I told you so far is really like we have some empirical objective and we can um, solve it using ERM, but we have to play this two-player uh, zero-sum game between hedge and, and ERM. So we're gonna, we are trying to extract like, as much as possible from, from ERM by not just calling it on a uniform distribution, but rather like a sequence of weighted uh, distributions. Uh, but then, okay, we do well on the, on the empirical objective, but we ultimately our goal is really to do well on the distributions, not just the uh, empirical data set. But we can sort of take that and generalize it uh, or carry it over to a generalization uh, statement by, uh, by also, again, using uniform convergence. So the statement here or the theorem is that once uh, we do all of this uh, for any class and for any set of transformations with high probability, we will guarantee that with respect to any transformation t, the average error of the, the R predictor, so this is um, 
one way of thinking about this is that we have we output a random uh, a distribution over predictors, and at test time we randomly sample one predictor. So it's not a deterministic predictor. It's an open question whether we can achieve the same sort of guarantee with a deterministic predictor. And uh, we, similar to before, the sample complexity here is controlled by VC dimension over n, and maybe it is possible to improve as well. Um, Okay, another lemma, maybe if we are curious about the, how, how large does this VC dimension of H composed with T when T is finite, so we can show that um, it, uh, it's at most the uh, original, like the VC dimension of the class H plus log cardinality of the set of transformations. Okay, so much time, I have a few minutes I think. Okay, so now uh, with that, maybe uh, uh, here's a motivation for another sort of objective that we might be interested in. So, uh, so far in this talk, we focused on the benchmark or the objective of uh, learning a predictor that minimizes worst case error over all transformations. But one can construct like very simple scenarios where that objective can be very bad. So here's an example. So imagine that we have just three classifiers in our class and we have three transformations. And the, uh, the performance or the error of these predictors is as reported in the table. So for example, H1 is, uh, does be nothing better than random uh, guessing on all the distributions, while H2 like, uh, messes up badly on two of them, but is really good on one of them. And lastly, H3 messes up on one of the distributions and then um, is good on the remaining two. So here, if we look at the benchmark from before, opt is gonna be 50%. So it's gonna be like really bad. So what I'm saying is that if you solve that objective of competing with opt, uh, like we can output, for example, H1. But in this case, H1 is kind of like, it's not doing well on any of them. Like, so it, it's really bad. And it might be better to output, for example, H3, where at least we are doing well on uh, some of the distributions, even if not all of them. So uh, this requires us, if we want to somehow sort of, um, Consider situations like this where we can't really do well on all the transformations, but maybe we can try to do uh, like well on as many of them as possible. So we will relax our objective to a, a different goal. Uh, so I, as I just said, to learn a predictor H hat that achieves low error on as many transformations as possible. And we can write this down, uh, I guess, mathematically into the following like optimization problem where we would like to uh, find a predictor H hat where we are counting so by summing over all transformations, we're counting how many transformations does the error of this predictor exceed like epsilon. So we wanna minimize that objective. So this is basically what this saying is, uh, find a predictor H that uh, achieves error epsilon on as many transformations as possible. And uh, what kind of theoretical guarantee can we give for this like uh, learning rule? Uh, we can say that um, for any class H, any collection of transformations with high probability over the draw of the training data, uh, that we can learn a predictor H hat. So this is by solving this optimization problem. Uh, the learned predictor, the number of transformations where it exceeds error like nine epsilon is gonna be at most the, uh, um, the uh, competing like with the, be with the best predictor H star in the class that it, uh, that, ex that achieves like error epsilon. So, okay, maybe th this is a bit uh, of a mouthful. But uh, basically we have the, the class and then we look for, okay, what is the best predictor in the class that achieves error uh, epsilon on as many, of the, as many transformations as possible? This is the benchmark. And this is gonna be like some number between like the size of T and zero. And we're saying that we're gonna match this number uh, um, uh, just from a finite sample n. Okay, and uh, this is a situation where we can actually achieve a fast rate, so instead of square root, uh, like the sample complexity, it doesn't grow as square root VC dimension of the composition over n, but instead it grows as VC dimension of the composition over n. And uh, really the main reason here is that we are kind of ignoring uh, transformations where we achieve high error. So this is where we can use like a sort of a, an optimistic guarantee for like uniform conversions. And uh, so we get like a fast rate from this. 
Um, so with this, I would like perhaps to summarize the, this talk. So in this talk, basically, maybe the main motivation was um, uh, to consider like a different way of describing distribution shifts through this language of transformations. And we've shown like some examples of when, when this might be like reasonable thing and uh, might be desirable. And then we looked at uh, situations where, uh, okay, one objective is to minimize the worst case error when we know the hypothesis class. So we have this min-max optimization problem. And then we looked at uh, minimizing the same objective but using only an ERM oracle. And this had sort of an algorithmic component to it. And then finally, we looked at a relaxed objective where maybe we would like to just do well on as many transformations as possible. So this sort of uh, work maybe motivates this game theoretic viewpoint on distribution shifts where, and maybe I think it's exciting in the sense that, okay, maybe it should, we should think of like designing architectures uh, that give us good transformations, like maybe transformations that uh, we expect to encounter like uh, when deploying models in the real world. And with that, uh, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much for this talk. Are there questions from the audience? There have been plenty already. Okay, nice talk. I just had two questions. Uh, the first one was, if we use a generative AI model to create samples from the source distribution, so would you term the operation as a transformation? Because you said that uh, the label should not change, right? Mm -hmm. So is that a transformation in your point of view, or you would not consider it as a transformation? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the generative models, yeah, I think it could be, it could be uh, viewed as a transformation of the original data. Uh, yes, I think, so th though le learning generative models in itself, like if you learn a generative model in order to sort of mimic sampling from the original distribution, it's sort of like uh, maybe, in some sense, maybe a harder problem. Uh, be because in some sense here, I guess we're, we're starting with a family of transformations we don't really, either we know that they are the transformations that we care about, or either it's just a big family and we want to do well on as many of them as possible. So they, like, yeah. Um. Uh, okay, and I had one more question. Like, we are, you're trying to create predictors which can perform best or better on as many transformations as possible, right? Mm -hmm. So what if two predictors uh, give you the same uh, performance on a different set of yeah, transformations? Yeah. Then mm -hmm. which one would you uh, classify as a good one? Yeah, yeah, great question. So at least with this formulation, we don't sort of uh, make distinction between, between those two predictors. They, they would be equally good. But perhaps there are other formulations where uh, uh, we can sort of like prefer like one over the other. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, if there is one more question. Otherwise, let's uh, thank again Omar. Thank you. Thank you.